First, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to tonight's engagement forum on ravines, um, our ecological treasures and essential community assets. Um, we're going to follow the similar format that's been held at other community engagement forums this year. There's been, I believe, six altogether. And uh, really, the, the intent here tonight is to share some information about ravines, um, just some general background information and things that will help maybe spur your thoughts and some of the conversation that we would like to have once the presenters are done. And um, so the first part of it, we have uh, four different speakers who are going to cover some different aspects of ravines for you. It'll take us about a half hour maybe to do that. And then we're going to open it up to the community for your questions and your um, ideas on things that you might like us to focus on for um, uh, on ravines in our community. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our alderman, uh, Randy Tack, who's here tonight to host uh, on behalf of our city council. Um, thanks, and uh, sorry for the attire. I was uh, coming late from work. Um, anyway, um, so thanks for coming. The idea for having this forum to, uh, to talk about ravines was, was mine. Uh, it came from uh, a city council discussion we had that was indirectly related to ravines. It had more to do with fences than anything else. But anyway, in the process of looking at the uh, ravines and the fences in the ravines, it came to me that uh, we were, I really don't know very much about them um, and what the status of them in town is, despite the fact that they're you know, a major feature of our landscape and uh, fairly important to the ecology of this area. And much of the city was actually designed around them, so I thought it might be interesting to have a discussion about them. Uh, anyway, I'd like to introduce the people, the knowledgeable people who are gonna speak tonight. Uh, first would be Glenn Adelson from Lake Forest College, um, John Santel from Lake Forest Open Lands, Peter Gordon from the uh, City of Lake Forest Parks and Forestry, and Chuck Myers. Um, and we'll just move on to them and then we'll uh, have a few questions and some discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, we're going to try to move that. That's the last or second to last slide. Thank you. I'm Glenn Adelson. Uh, uh, professor of Environmental Studies at Lake Forest College. Uh, I'm here to talk about the geological history and the ecological uniqueness of uh, the ravines in Lake Forest and along uh, the North Shore of um, Lake Michigan. Um, the ravines that we have were created by a unique series of events and because there were, there were a unique series of events historically, uh, it is a unique ecosystem and has a unique community of plant and animal species. Uh, the, um, the beginning of the story is the end of the last glacier. As many of you know, about 15,000 years ago, there was uh, a mile and a half to two miles of ice uh, where we are. And as the, as the climate warmed and the glacier receded and melted, uh, there were times when the amount of melting uh, equaled the amount of new, glacier depos new glacial deposition, uh, and that could last a hundred, several hundred years. Um, and uh, when that happened, when the glacier stalled in one place, uh, this is when moraines were formed. Moraine, M-O-R-A-I-N-E. Uh, we are on the Highland Park moraine right now. And uh, w moraines are formed by debris falling out of the glacial ice, gravity taking the, the um, sediment that the glacier was carrying, anything from fine clays to large boulders would fall out. And when they fell out in one place, that gives us the topography that we have where we live right now. So you know that uh, despite uh, the reputation that the Chicago area has. It is not a perfectly flat land. We have uh, rises and we have bottoms and, and um, we know that we have bluffs uh, right before the beaches um, or actually uh, technically right behind the beaches um, on Lake Michigan. So about 14,000 years ago uh, there was the deposition of the Highland Park moraine. 
Uh, the next uh, unique thing that happened was about 10,000 years ago, the weight of the glacial ice as it uh, was changing the landscape uh, opened up a, um, an out path for the, all the water in Lake Michigan in the north, uh, the Ottawa River in Canada, basically Lake Michigan drained to the north. Lake Michigan is about 285 feet deep at its deepest point, and the, the water levels in Lake Michigan at that time, 10,000 years ago, with this outflow to the north, uh, actually dropped 250 feet. So what was left was whatever the basin that was about 35 or 40 feet deep. Uh, and so the Lake Michigan itself uh, became much, much smaller. And, and there was a, a very long um, basin-shaped shore. There was a forest there. People have found stumps of large trees uh, on the uh, on the floor of um, the, sea, the lake floor of uh, Lake Michigan. Uh, and when that happened, that remained in place for about 2,000 years. Uh, and because you can imagine what the, um, uh, what's now the basin looked like, it was like a bathtub, uh, but it was empty of water. So when, when um, rain and snow came, when rain fell and snow melted, it started to form streams that went into this rump Lake Michigan, which was called, is called Lake Chippewa by geologists. Um, these streams, because of the, um, the steepness of the, uh, the sides of this basin, um, started to rise and uh, the headwaters eroded in uh, in the direction of land. At the same time, there was still glaciers melting and forming streams above uh, going towards the bluffs of the Highland Park Ravine, uh, High Highland Park Moraine, I should say. And uh, at about 8,000 years ago, uh, headwaters of the lake bed erosion and the streams that were coming over land um, started to merge together. And this was the beginning of the formation of the ravines that we have today. Um, so as you can see, this is a very uh, unique set of events. This has not happened um, in, in very many places in the world. Let's see if this works. What I want to show you here, I don't know if you can make it out. Uh, these are the drainage basins, the major drainage basins of um, North America. And what I want you to pay particular attention to is uh, how close the Gulf of Mexico drainage is to Lake Michigan, exactly where we are. Exactly where we are. We are right next to the um, to waters, to, to land where if water fell, it would naturally go into the Gulf of Mexico as opposed to Lake Michigan. Um, so this gives us um, a view, uh, a, a much closer in view of where we are. We're about where that uh, triangle is on Lake Michigan. And you can see the uh, um, north branch, the three uh, forks of the north branch of the Chicago River, um, just to the west of Lake Michigan. Um, yes. Yeah, let me see if that works. It's right there, about where we are, but then it slides down the incline. Um, so in any event, uh, I want to, I Chuck, if you can go to the next one. Nope, the other direction. Thank you. Uh, this gives us an even closer look. Uh, and what you see here is um, the watershed basically a subcontinental divide between water that goes directly into Lake Michigan through the ravines and water, if it falls on just to the west of Green Bay Road, it goes into the middle fork of the north branch of the Chicago River and the Skokie River. If it falls just to the east of um, Green Bay Road, that water goes directly into Lake Michigan. You have the other continental divide that's right here just to the west of the toll road where water falling to the west of this uh, stippled line will go into the Des Plaines River which flows into the Illinois which flows into the Mississippi which flows into the Gulf of Mexico. Now Chuck if you can go back one 
Um, and what you all know, uh, uh, the, a famous story of Chicago, is under natural conditions, water that flowed, that, that dropped between Green Bay Road and that uh, Continental Divide near the Des Plaines River would have naturally gone out into Lake Michigan as well. But we dug canals, we humans dug canals, and turned the Chicago River so it flows backwards. This is a very important point because uh, our ravines, this means that our ravines are the only recharge of Lake Michigan. The, the water that falls to the west of Green, Green Bay Road that initially would have gone into the north branch of the Chicago River would have gone out through the Chicago River right at uh, where it meets Lake Michigan downtown. It doesn't do that anymore. It goes to New Orleans. And so water that would have replenished Lake Michigan no longer replenishes Lake Michigan. Uh, Chuck, if you could move it forward for me. One more. So here's a, here's a picture of our ravines. It, it's actually formed two processes. The erosion uh, stream, uh, erosion from above moving out towards the river, and headwater erosion from those streams in, in Lake Chippewa when the lake level was very low are actually, or actually did, chew it up from the bottom. Uh, it's, it's an interesting set of effects. But one of the things you can see is the ravines that we have are open to the lake. And being open to the lake, they're, they're subject to the lake effect. The lake effect being that, that uh, lakes have the highest, or I should say water, has the highest specific heat of any common material, which means it takes more energy to raise or lower the temperature of water one degree than it takes uh, for any other material. What that means next is that the lake is cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter than the land. And so these openings of the ravines are cooler in the summer than the rest of the landscape. And that gives rise to the unique ecological communities that we find uh, in our ravines. And so I'll just give you a couple of examples, and then I'll turn to John Santel, who will have a lot more to say about this. Uh, Chuck, if you can just show the next couple. So we have in our ravines, in Lake Forest, we have plants of the far north. I take my students on field trips to northern Wisconsin to learn the northern flora, and we see plants like ground juniper far north. It is not found anywhere else in Lake County. It's not found anywhere else in the greater Chicago area, but it's found in the ravines. And the next one, and the most, uh, one of the most beloved trees of all is the paper birch or the white birch of the far north. And these last two pictures were both taken just two days ago in McCormick Ravine, which is um, probably the um, most ecological the ravine of the highest ecological quality of any of the ravines of the North Shore. So John, I'll turn things over to you. Thanks, Chuck. So thank you, uh, Glenn, for that great history and overview on ravines. And uh, I'm John Centel, President of the Lake Forest Open Lands Association, and a special thanks to the aldermen and for uh, folks from the city for having this forum. It's a great thing. We appreciate it very much. Um, am I ready to go there? Yeah. Okay. So um, I think everyone tonight here would agree that Lake Forest is a special place for many reasons, but including our open spaces and our natural areas. And by living here, we are the recipients and stewards of the great geologic uh, and natural gift that Glenn just described. There really is no other place nationally uh, just like where we live in terms of natural landscapes and habitat diversity except perhaps Northeast Ohio along Lake Erie and Cleveland has the Browns and the Indians so that's not that much fun there anyway. So from time to time we really need to stop and consider where we live and we have the incredible, we have this incredible freshwater sea and we have beachfront, and we have bluffs, and we have upland woodlands, and we have uh, prairies and savanna, and of course, these remarkable ravines that you see on this slide right here. And that is over by Bluffs Edge Drive. Um, from a natural standpoint, it's not only beautiful, but has real conservation value and environmental significance beyond our borders. There's really 
nothing like these ravines. And Lake Forest is really what I like to call a conservation community. It's something that makes living here so special. Her land has always been central to who we are. It's hard to imagine living in Lake Forest without our open spaces. We've come to expect it. And, and if you don't live here, you hear people say, wow, we don't have anything like that in our community. And our open spaces really define our community, uh, not, un not, like, uh, not unlike Market Square or the college. And so it follows that it's hard to imagine Lake Forest uh, without our ravines. Um, if you can imagine our city without its contours and without its ridges and slopes and distant, vi uh, distant vistas, it's, it's hard to do. No bridges to cross uh, wooded valleys. A uh, hundred years ago, as Glenn mentioned, much of our streetscape was actually designed around these ravines. And so Lake Forest ravines are one of the key things that make Lake Forest a special place. Um, Glenn talked about our ravines geologically and touched upon why they're so special in terms of hab habitat, in terms of microclimate and rare species. And in fact, many of you may drive by this gate on Sheridan Road and not know what's behind there, but beyond the gate is McCormick Ravine, McCormick Preserve, which is considered truly a crown jewel, not just in the Chicago area, but recognized by the state of Illinois, of, in, of state of Illinois as something that is exceptionally uh, unique in its natural value. So while many residents appreciate our ravines to a certain extent, I think that, um, I think that Many times we don't really think about them beyond their distant beauty that we see. They certainly haven't always gotten the attention or the understanding that they deserve. And like many habitats, such as wetlands and prairies, over the course of time, they were largely misunderstood and negatively impacted by things such as development. They may have been forgotten or altered or degraded or filled or whatever, as their core value to us really wasn't understood and appreciated. And along the entire north shore of Chicago, historically, we really haven't embraced ravines um, why our ravines are so important and how to take care of those ravines. Their importance in terms of biodiversity, um, how essential they are for birds. Birds travel all the way from South America and depend on being able to stop in our ravines here and take a break. Um, how our ravines help to clean our water, how they protect our soil, ultimately how they contribute to the health of Lake Michigan, and also how they support our economic infrastructure. But things are changing, and people are recognizing that. And this is tonight's a, an example of how that's happening. I just got back yesterday from the state of Lake Michigan Great Lakes Beach Conference up in Sheboygan. And at this meeting, attended by environmental professionals um, from around the lake, it was agreed to define Lake Michigan as this. They said, an outstanding natural resource of global significance, under stress, and need of special attention. And that's how they define Lake Michigan. And as I listened to it, I thought, you know what? In many ways, we could define our ravines that way as well. For decades, our lack of understanding and attention has negatively impacted our, our ravines. Some of the North Shore ravines were filled to allow for roads and buildings. Some were used as landfills. Most were and still are used as the fastest way to get rainwater and stormwater off the land, either from our streets or parking lots and our yards. So while some of our ravines have been surprisingly resilient, uh, they definitely need our help. And that's what's nice about and exciting about this kind of forum tonight is that we're seeing community engagement and discussing how we can all work together to better understand and protect our ravines. And in a moment, Chuck and, uh, and uh, Peter will talk more about this. Um, let me see here. There we go. I thought I'd rever refer back to this chart again and reiterate a, an important fact on our ravines. Our ravines are owned both publicly by the city and also privately, um, mostly privately, by individual landowners, yet they course through and connect many neighborhoods and several institutions, such as the college and, and woodlands. But really, we are all connected to these ravines and their health, because anyone who wants clean water in Lake Michigan wants to protect the infrastructure in our community, wants to protect our beautiful vistas, appreciates the diversity of bird and animal and plant species in Lake Forest, and especially, as Glenn said, anyone who lives east of Green Bay Road is directly connected to the health of our ravines. And the only way to protect them, because of this circumstance, the only way to protect them is to work together as a community. Um, Glenn touched on the tremendous natural value of our ravines. Most of us don't trek down in the ravines very often, but they are beautiful and they're full of life and home to 
a wonderful array and diverse species right in our backyards, such as uh, owls, who incidentally help to keep our skunk populations down in town. Uh, they are red-headed woodpeckers, trillium, and foxes, just to make a few, name a few. Over 250 species of birds, over 250 species of birds use the Lake Michigan Flyway and depend on the ravines and the shoreline habitats. So they're very important. Now, I've been asked to touch on some of the challenges facing our ravines and what we might do. Uh, protection and restoration of our ravines is a very broad topic, and much of this, um, much of ravine restoration is very site-specific. So in my remaining few minutes, I thought it'd be best to give a broad overview of some of the key issues facing our ravines. Uh, the solutions to these issues will take more, more conversation and a lot of community engagement. But in broad terms, there are three key challenges facing our ravines, all of which can be addressed and all of which can be minimized. First, stormwater uh, runoff and erosion. Secondly, the loss of landscape buffers, which contribute to the former, and thirdly, invasive species. So there's a lot of other threats which I won't detail here, such as illegal dumping or septic maintenance, construction debris, vandalism, those kind of things, but really what we should focus on is the big three. So I'll start with uh, stormwater runoff. This is really our ravine's biggest challenge, and for those of you who attended the community forum on water, uh, this may ring a bell. Our ravines are constantly changing. They're slumping, shifting, and much of this is natural. A century ago, much of the rainwater in Lake Michigan and Lake Forest meandered and percolated down its way to Lake Michigan via our wetlands and our ravines. And this was a natural process, but that has changed. Over the last hundred years, our goal has been get the water off the land as quickly as possible, uh, get it off our roofs and our gutters and our driveways, send it in the storm sewers, and we've been successful. We've been very good at this, and this is what's stormwater runoff. And most of this east of Green Bay goes to our ravines. So if you live east of Green Bay, your stormwater flows through the storm sewers and heads directly to Lake Michigan via the ravines. If you live west of Green Bay, as Glenn talked about, it goes to the Gulf of Mexico. So some rainwater naturally finds its way to the ravine still. And along the way, whatever fertilizer you put on your lawn and it's not absorbed, or the car wash you dump down the sewer, or the water you direct from your roof or parking lot heads directly to Lake Michigan via the ravines as well, and ends up in the same place we get our drinking water, Lake Michigan. Now here's a picture of storm water uh, from Fort Sheridan heading into Lake Michigan. As you can see from this picture, during a storm event, the amount of water rushing down our ravines can be incredibly intense. And you're correct if you're saying, but hey, I thought ravines naturally transport our rainwater to the lake. But what isn't natural is the amount of rainwater and the kind of rainwater that our ravines transport today. Our ravines, ravines used to take about this much water, and now we expect them to take about this much water. And they just can't do it. You can't put uh, a round peg in a square hole. So this amount of stormwater is what causes substantial erosion in our ravines, and it compromises the so slopes. It sends valuable soil and seeds and plants that protect the ravine right out to Lake Michigan and ultimately reduces water quality and the stability of our ravines. And poor water quality is a result of all the sediment in the lake and all the pesticides and the fertilizer and the grease and the metals and the animal waste and organic matter that we send down the sewer systems. So ongoing erosion at this pace goes beyond just impacting water quality and it, under, it actually undermines home foundations, roads, bridges, damages sewer lines, and, co and causes loss of land. So addressing the health of our ravines has a real economic impact as well as environmental impact. And the reality is most scientists expect that the severity of rainstorms and associated floodings, like we saw uh, in last April, to increase. So a solution, well, you've probably heard the term green infrastructure before, and in terms of stormwater, that really means keeping the rainwater <coughs> excuse me, on the landscape as long as possible and letting nature economically do the job nature intended to do. It's best for nature and economics to try and keep the rainwater where it falls and reduce runoff and to keep the bad, thing out of our run the bad things out of our runoff like fertilizer, like driveway sealant, like salt and pesticides. There are ways to do this. Rain gardens, limit watering, rain barrels, less impervious services, planting trees, etc., etc. But we need to start to embrace those those, those approaches. Many invasive species thrive in poor soil that has been compacted, eroded, polluted, or degraded. They're opportunistic and will quickly take over where a native 
has been compromised. And many of these invasives are what we call backyard escapees, plants innocently put in gardens and yards that are bad actors, but we simply weren't aware of them when we put them in our gardens. And because ravines are so unique, many people simply don't know how to recognize some of the bad actors in the ravines. So a first step is to give our ravines a helping hand is to identify who these bad guys are. And this is where organizations like Lake Forest Open Lands Association, our garden clubs, the city, and local conservation experts, and there are many of them around town, can really help uh, to, to identify these guys. It really does take a community to manage invasives because one yard connects to the next yard, which connects to the next yard, which connects to the ravine. And so dealing with invasives is only possible if it's a group effort and if private homeowners get involved. So it can't just be left up to our city and the local land trust. We all need to work together. Um, I thought I'd quickly share a list of what I might call the regular invasives that many people recognize, and they can be separated into two categories. The first one are what we call backyard escapees or common invasives, which ironically are promoted by the nursery trade for years, and now they're spreading into our ravines. These include Japanese barberry, multiflora rose, goutweed, myrtle, which is otherwise called vinca, uh, buckthorn, uh, honeysuckle, Norway maple. In fact, Norway maple seeds spread so much, and what they do is they create such a dense leaf cover in the ravines that nothing can grow underneath them. So they're actually uh, bad. All those trees are bad for the ravines. Um, and they also shade out the potential for oaks to grow. Uh, garden valerian, and this has been identified in some backyards leading down to the Walden uh, Ravine Bridge. It's getting started. It's a real tough one, and we need to nail it now. Um, the, then there are what we call the naturalized invasive weeds that spread. And these are basically Japanese knotweed and garlic mustard. And uh, Walden Ravine actually has a big peach piece of a uh, big clump of Japanese knotweed going on it. And I know the college is trying hard to er eradicate Japanese knotweed in their ravines, and Glenn's doing great work with that. So, well, I think I've, I've uh, overstepped my allotted time to talk. Uh, there's much to discuss in this topic. What's great is that we're seeing our community beginning to move in the right direction in terms of understanding and caring for our ravines. You'll hear more from Peter and Chuck about how we're all moving to engage landowners and the community. Uh, we've begun to invest in them and how we're uh, having success with applying for grants and coordinating work days and conducting research. And in closing, I want to repeat something I've said before and to some snickers, no less, that I think that one day we could see steelhead trout and other fish run in the ravines again, especially McCormick Ravine, and I'll be the first one standing there with a fly rod smiling. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, John. Good evening. I'm Peter Gordon. I'm with the City of Lake Forest. Um, and welcome again. Thank you for coming this evening. So uh, if you haven't figured it out by now, uh, ravines are fragile ecosystems uh, that require care and maintenance. Uh, a lot of times they're overlooked. Uh, they're in people's backyards. They look past them to see the beauty of the trees, but they never, they never usually look down the embankment. Without maintenance, erosion caused naturally or influenced by development will create uncontrollable changes. Keeping the banks of the ravines and bluffs stable will reduce the need for expensive repairs and prevent loss of tableland. So no two ravines are alike. So if I can get you to close your eyes for one second and imagine the natural state of a ravine, it should be open and light. There's a woodland crest that should have a gentle slope with filtered sun, covered with native trees and shrubs and woodland plants, interspersed with seeps where wetland plants and mosses grow. At the bottom of the ravine, a recurrent stream leads to a beach community of plants from the mouth of the ravine and the beach beyond. Unfortunately, this is what most ravines look like here in Lake Forest and other areas along the North Shore. They're overgrown with non-native trees and invasive plants, there's a dense canopy that exists that cut off sunlight to the native ground cover and plants, leaving bare and easily eroded areas. They're heavily shaded ravines that lose their productive plant cover, resulting in eroded areas and increased instability. John mentioned the non-native plants such as buckthorn, uh, Norway maple, sometimes rose and other plants. And I think that at times there's a misconception about the city and the city's tree preservation ordinance when it comes to tree removal. 
For many of you who've been to Forest Park or seen a lot of the other ravines the city's been working on lately, tree removal is certainly a key aspect in that. And I think all too many times people are afraid of the preservation ordinance and feel that they can't take down trees. But I can personally say that I've worked with many of you in this room uh, this evening, uh, and we've probably taken out more trees than maybe uh, people would have thought we would have allowed. Uh, but the fact of the matter is a lot of the trees, invasive trees in particular, Norway maples and other trees like that, really cause more damage to the ecosystem of these sensitive ravines. And therefore, through proper permitting, proper uh, consulting, the city is more uh, likely to be engaged in allowing the type of tree removal that's taken place over time. A lot of times we get calls and people asking about uh, the ravines uh, and that they think they're failing. And beyond the trees, we often come to large piles of landscape debris, broken pipes, failing retaining walls, shoddy craftsmanship, if you will, uh, and just the lack of common knowledge about ravines. For many years, uh, even city staff have uh, used ravines over the years for dumping areas for leaves, for other debris. And about 10 years ago, uh, there was really a push, a push to kind of educate people on ravines. Uh, and so those types of things really stopped happening. No longer do the city crews push things, leaves over the ravines. Most homeowners are conscientious enough to not push things over the ravines as well. And um, it really has made a huge difference. We're starting to see different types of plant material come around, different types of plant material grow. Uh, a lot of times in these ravines, people are unaware of the uprooted trees. They're unaware of the failing infrastructure, the broken pipes, the retaining walls. Uh, and quite honestly, as John mentioned, these are homes for wildlife, and there's usually less wildlife in these areas. So here's just another example of how a homeowner unknowingly uh, has paid for their landscapers to pick up their leaves and collect their grass clippings and actually throw them over the edge of the bluff as opposed to hauling them away. You can see this makeshift drainage pipe as well, going to the bottom of the ravine. This one happened to have several cracks in it, and so the water actually created more erosion problems than was probably necessary. And so uh, working with ravines, people think sometimes it needs to cost a lot of money, uh, and there are times when it definitely can. But simple things like we talked about, about erosion, or I'm sorry, invasive uh, tree removal, uh, certainly doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Uh, invasive plants like goutweed and rose can certainly be taken out by the average homeowner uh, through the use of loppers or pruners, chainsaws, and uh, alike. Um, it's important to remove any of the woody landscape debris that's along the edge of the bluffs, to go ahead and open up the canopy, to use proper products when removing these trees so that we don't pollute our streams and our wetlands, uh, and to go ahead and allow light in. What you see here in this particular picture is a check dam. A check dam is, again, a cheap solution to slowing up the water and allowing water to go ahead and flow naturally. Now, as you can imagine, there's a lot of costly things uh, you can do as far as stabilizing ravines, and I'll show you a couple of these slides in a second. But certainly the true naturalist, the one that works with the Army Corps of Engineers, stormwater management, are the people who don't show that they've impacted the ravines by man-made structures. So um, all too often we fall in line with putting man-made structures in. Uh, that's not always the case. By using plant material, by raising the bed of the ravine, uh, we can go ahead and create very nice, gentle slopes that really fit nature. So here's one example of a gamium basket uh, commonly used in ravines. Uh, they can be uh, extensive um, or they can be really extensive. Let's see if this is working, sorry. Such as this one. Uh, and this happens to be at our Lake Forest Cemetery and you can see the pitch there and so we're kind of limited in how we can go ahead and do that. Uh, but these types of techniques along with gamey or riprap and installation of storm sewers really have positive income uh, outcomes as far as maintaining the integrity of the ravines and the bluffs. Channel lining is another way of helping the bottom of the bluff and the ravine. And then certainly uh, replanting native vegetation. Uh, here you can see the Lake Forest Cemetery, a uh, project that was done several years ago. You can see the before and after. 
Uh, we talked about the invasive trees. We talked about the undercutting and the uprooting, uh, what that causes as far as uh, the degradation of the ravine system. On the bottom, you can see more of a meandering slope. It's not as steep. There's less trees. There's more ground vegetation there. Uh, there's a subtle degree of rocks on the bottom to help slow and filter the water as it makes it to the lakefront. And so replanting ravines with native plant material, plant material that's not invasive, is certainly a key component to this. Uh, the city has on its website a ravine guide for residents, which lists a lot of plant material that can be used. Uh, we're changing it as uh, we educate ourselves, either through forums like this or through national conferences. Uh, and we recognize that ravines are key areas uh, for our community. Again, a before and after, you can see the gaming baskets were used on the bottom. You can see uh, how this was before with the slanting trees there. Uh, what that could do it with, um, if it were to fall and erode away, the amount of damage that could cause. Uh, and so it's really important uh, for residents, especially in this day and age, with the threat of emerald ash borer to get into their backyards. Um, we are probably going to lose over 100,000 trees here in town because of emerald ash borer. A lot of these ravines are heavy in ash trees. When ash trees break, they become brittle and they fall into these ravines. And ultimately what they're going to do is they're going to alter the flowage of the water, cutting into people's slopes. Uh, eventually sloughing will take place, which will uh, lose some of people's greatest investment, their home uh, and their property and certainly do long-term damage. And so um, it's important to get out there to do an inventory, not only on what's occurring now, but what could be occurring in the future. Um, and so with that, I think there's a lot of great opportunity out there. Chuck's gonna go ahead and talk about some of the opportunities the city has uh, followed up with. And um, if anyone has any questions later on, we'll all be happy to answer them. Thank you. All right, uh, as Peter said, I'm Chuck Myers. I'm with the city also. Uh, and thanks to Peter and John and Glenn. Uh, hopefully now uh, you have a better, better understanding of why we consider these such special and important places. Uh, so I want to uh, make sure we give you enough time to be part of this discussion. So I'm gonna be pretty brief. Uh, I'm just gonna talk about a few of the grants that the city is pursuing right now. Uh, we are, there are three grants that I'm going to talk about. Uh, one of them is on the very bottom of the map, McCormick Jane. Uh, and these are all city owned, in, at least in part, city owned uh, ravines. So McCormick Ravine on the bottom, uh, and then up about halfway, uh, the Witch Hazel Seminary Ravine, that's at Forest Park, and then way at the top, the Cemetery Ravine. Uh, so the first one is the, it, it, the grant is called the Fort Sheridan Ravine and Coastal Restoration Grant. Uh, it, 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 as I said, it does involve McCormick, but it's also involving Jane's Ravine. That is on the Forest Preserve property, but it joins up with the McCormick before it flows into Lake Michigan. So those are both part of it. This is a very large grant. Uh, it's been... Uh, the focus of a study by the Army Corps for about the last five years. Uh, they are getting close now on this. Uh, so uh, it is part of a what's called the Section 506 Great Lakes Fishery and Ecosystem Restoration. And this is, uh, as it says, fishery. So uh, what John was talking about earlier with McCormick maybe having fish, uh, this grant would certainly help to accomplish that. Uh, but then the second part is ecosystem, and that has to do with restoring the ravines. A lot of what Peter talked about uh, with the ravines and the maintenance that needs to be done to, uh, to eliminate erosion or control the erosion, uh, to stabilize the base, all that kind of stuff, that's what this is all about. Um, there's also a lot of structure that's left in the ravine at McCormick. It's the old concrete and... Uh, uh, drain tiles, so all that would have to be removed, and that's extensive. If you've ever been out there, you've seen it. Uh, but it, along with that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, stabilizing the ravine, planting it with natives, of course, uh, and habitat restoration that would be uh, suitable for uh, lake fish. Um, this is a, the grant itself. Uh, 
uh, is a 15, I'm sorry, not the grant, but this program covers a 15, it's 15 million dollars uh, to complete right now is the estimate. In Lake Forest, there is about uh, 2.5 million of that uh, to do our ravine and Jane's. Um, the partners on this are Lake, Forest, or Lake County Forest Preserve, uh, Open Lands, the town of Fort Sheridan, and of course the city. So this, as I said, this has been a long time in the works. Uh, we're still working out the details, uh, but we hope to be moving forward and finding out uh, if that will be awarded soon. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. The McCormick, as everyone else has said, is a very special place. That's the one that we really uh, want to try to do something as soon as possible. So the second one, I'm going to go to the other end of the city, up on the north, uh, east, north uh, east corner, uh, the cemetery ravine. Uh, Peter had a picture there of it, of some of the previous work that was done out there a number of years ago. But the, uh, two years ago, the city uh, hired Conservation Design Forum to evaluate and study the ravine and make determinations of uh, kind of a feasibility of what needed to be done or what could be done. Uh, it did show that the ravine is in poor quality right now. There's a lot of erosion, a lot of downed trees in it, a lot of things that need to be addressed. Uh, so working, uh, th what, what they did was put together a plan for us, a restoration plan. We then took that plan and we applied for a grant uh, with the Illinois EPA. Um, this is part of the Clean Water Act. So we, um, we would like to restore and stabilize the ravine uh, bottom, and that would include some of those same techniques with uh, things like adding riffles and ponds and uh, stone, uh, but also the introduction of native plants and, um, and, and to help stabilize the whole system. Uh, the project partners on that one, you can see, uh, list the Lake Forest Collaborative for Environmental uh, lead Stewardship. Sorry, I put the wrong thing on there. It's actually leadership, uh, but that's good too, but it is leadership. Um, so uh, if you don't know about the collaborative, it was formed about a year ago. It, uh, it's a uh, group of different institutions in the city, uh, around the city of Lake Forest. It includes Lake Forest Open Lands. Uh, John Sintel uh, is the representative there. It also includes the Lake Forest College, which Glenn uh, is, a member, is the representative there. Uh, I am on it with Kurt Volkman as city representatives um, and the school districts as well. Uh, so as you can see, it's a mix of uh, people that are heavily involved with education and uh, management of city properties. So this is a $473,000 project. That's the total cost. Uh, that's uh, and the city would have to pay about 40% of that. The final uh, grant that I want to talk about is you can see by the name. Uh, this is the Lake. Forest Environmental Collaborative Ravine Restoration and Outreach Program. This is something that was put together by the group I just mentioned. Uh, about a year ago when we were formed, we decided to uh, take a few things as our first year objectives. And one of those things was ravines. So this was very important for us uh, to get, get off to a, a start in looking at what we could do for the ravines in Lake Forest. We centered this on the Seminary Ravine, the one that's, uh, that flows out uh, near uh, Forest Park. Uh, and this is a grant that is designed to be educational, uh, but also to engage the residents. So it does involve some stewardship type activities, uh, land management, uh, but it, this one is really more about educating the community about the importance of ravines. We, we think this could be a model for other communities once it's developed, but we are looking at uh, putting this uh, 
this plan into effect. So it, it fits with the goals of the collaborative. It's, a, it's, it's all about education. Um, it's a $158,000 project. Uh, and as you can see, it, it is uh, uh, administered by the Department of Natural Resources uh, through their Illinois Coastal Management Program. This uh, is the first time this grant has been offered. It's a brand new series of grants. And we are very happy to announce that uh, last Saturday, Governor Quinn announced that we are uh, the recipients of one of these grants. So we're very excited about that and honored and looking forward to going forward with that. Uh, we are going to open up for some questions, but I wanted to mention a couple other things on this main slide that you've seen a couple times. Um, first of all, I think it's interesting to note that um, total parcels along our ravines, there's 172, and of those, 91% of our ravines are privately owned. So there really is a very small percentage that's public land that the city is, you know, as Chuck just covered it, we're involved in. But uh, really, it's going to take such a community effort here to really make um, uh, progress on our ravines. And John touched on that. Obviously, everybody that's speaking here tonight has a real desire to see everyone work together on the ravines. But uh, it's kind of a unique uh, aspect because when we talk about the ravines, um, I don't think a lot of people in town know that they're primarily privately owned uh, ravines. So just thought that I wanted to call that out because that was on the key at the top. I know it's a little bit hard to, uh, to read. So we'll leave that up there. But um, we're just going to open it up then for questions from people. And um, uh, we really want to also kind of, there was a few questions on your agenda about what do you see as the challenges and uh, to move us forward and to start to talk about this and what, do, what could be things that we want to uh, pursue as we go forward into the future as well. Uh, the question was uh, whether or not we, uh, the water levels and replenishing that, whether we see any, uh, what the trends of that are going to be. So. Uh, yes, uh, uh, as we uh, talked about, for those of you who were here f uh, for our water um, symposium, uh, when you turn on your tap water, when you wash a carrot, when you take a bath or a shower, the water is coming out of Lake Michigan and going into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, that is true. W w the replenishment comes from uh, the rain rainwater and stormwater that goes through the ravines, uh, the water that goes into your drains gets sent to Highland Park where it is processed and then put into um, the Skokie River, is it? Uh, the Skokie River, um, just south of the Chicago Botanic Garden, goes down into uh, the Chicago River and instead of going out into Lake Michigan, again goes uh, through the, um, the channels into um, the Gulf of Mexico. So all human use of water uh, is lowering the water levels of Lake Michigan. And this is what makes the ravine so important because it, other than rain that directly falls on Lake Michigan, uh, this is the only uh, overland source of water that's, that replenishes um, the lake. So do we believe it's going to dry up in like 40 years? Do we, do we see it going down another foot? Uh, it certainly could go down another foot in, in 40 years. It's not going to dry up in 40 years, but there are uh, other examples of this. The Aral Sea, which is on the border of Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan out in Central Asia, was in fact larger than Lake Michigan, and it has been reduced to 20% of its uh, former size. So something like this could happen under very... Um, extreme mismanagement. Uh, we don't have that level of extreme mismanagement that they had in the former Soviet Union, um, but it is something, it, it's a cautionary tale. Next. Gentleman right back there. Does anybody audit the ravines? I mean, we recently had a slide in ours which is going to be pretty substantial expense in order to replace it, and we wouldn't have noticed it unless somebody accidentally saw it. So do we ever let homeowners know what the state of the ravines are? Or is there 
Uh, we currently do not audit the ravines. However, if our staff are out and we see something, we try to let homeowners know. However, um, just a few years ago, the Great Lakes, Alliance for Great Lakes, did actually um, come up to the, the North Shore area and did do some assessments of ravines and identified structures and um, some uh, information related to that. Um, we had hoped maybe they'd be able to join us tonight, but there was a conflict on their schedule. But they have information posted on their website and they have um, a lot of information, tools, kits and things that um, you know you can assess and they'll give you some uh, suggested people who can come out and do an assessment of your ravine um, and that is something that we can talk about as a community is whether or not as a community we'd like to do assessments of our ravine I think it was Chuck was at Highland Park that just recently completed that yeah Highland Park did and uh, this map actually uh, Chuck you're gonna have to talk yeah about it. I'm sorry. Yeah, Highland Park is uh, also, they have a number of ravines, and they just uh, studied all theirs. Uh, but one of the things that, as we were putting this together, we realized that a lot of the data we have, we need to update. So it's one of the things that uh, we as a city, we want to pursue uh, studying these better and knowing better what we have. Can I, just add sure, sure. I would say that the McCormick Ravine, which... Um, Lake Forest Open Lands manages along with the city. We do have audits. We do a, a lot of study in there, and we do track things in there, and so that's a, a benefit, so we know it works. And I would say as part of the Illinois Coastal Management Program grant, we will be able to present to homeowners some of these tools which whereby we can work with you, the city, Lake Forest Open Lands, to have you audit. If we're interested in, in, in uh, going to see best practices, is McCormick the place we should go? Uh, not right, right now. Uh, no. <laughs> Down at the. Um, John, could you repeat the question? In the microphone? Oh, go ahead, Chuck. You repeat. Uh, you're looking for other places that you can go to see best practices. I would suggest uh, if you go to the Lake County Forest Preserve property at Fort Sheridan, they have two ravines that they are uh, they have done some restoration on, particularly the Hutchinson Ravine. Uh, is one that has been very successful. There are more to the south, but that's the closest one. We don't have an answer on that right now, but the question. Uh, the question was, uh, can the city do something to incentivize uh, private homeowners to take on the ravines and work together and, and to make improvements? Um, we don't have an answer for you on that one, but we it's one of the things that um, we certainly want to add to the list as a future opportunity to talk about, uh, especially now that we're um, seeing more interest by the private homeowners and working on these kinds of things, too. Um, I don't know if, Glenn, did you want to yeah. add to that? Um. Uh, any summary statistic can be misleading. The 91%, if you look right in the center of the map, you see that orange-colored large property is mostly Lake Forest College. That's a private institution, so it's privately owned. But uh, Lake Forest College is committed to do whatever we can to restore the ravines, and most of the classes that I teach have a ravine restoration aspect to it. So uh, it's not quite as high as 91%. I would, just, I would just suggest that that's a great question. And I think because, because these ravines are so valuable to our city and for the natural infrastructure, we need to find a way to incentivize and engage landowners to help us to, to, make, to save them to make, improve our water quality. And I think we can be really creative on that, like we have been in so many other things. So that is, that is I think, one of the great opportunities for our community. I, I, I'm just going to add to my wife's comment that the, court, the issue is One landowner on one side wants to do it. You can't just do half the ravine. No, you, you can can't. maybe do some slope remediation and so forth, but you can't do on someone else's property unless they give you permission to do so. And then the question is who's paying for that? So that's part of the, the corollary. So yep. most of these things are actually split ownership in the ravine itself. Yep. Good question from the college. Um, um, you're, that, I'm, thank you for pointing out that that huge orange section is Lake Forest College land. 
and obviously as a, as a teacher and an environmental and advocate, um, with your classes, do you have students in the ravine able to identify, you know, do they get a hands-on, and if so, is there a way to create a community volunteer base of helping to clear some of the invasive species and all, such that it gives citizens of Lake Forest or other communities an opportunity to get into ravines to understand what it takes and how to remove because they're learning from you or your colleagues? Uh, the answer, um, the question was, uh, do the students get hands-on work in the ravine? Do they learn how to identify both the native and uh, uh, invasive species uh, and work on uh, 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 promoting native species and eradicating invasive species, and the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, at, at two of the classes that I'm teaching right now, uh, one class on Tuesday, we were down in the ravine l puzzling over the Japanese knotweed, the knotty problem of the Japanese knotweed, um, and, and just going over all of the various solutions. And then the, uh, in our next meeting, uh, uh, Mike Hahn of the Lake Forest Open Lands Association, who's been working on this for years, is going to uh, provide us with his expertise and, and talk to us about, well, if we decide to use an herbicide, uh, what are the pluses and minuses of that? If we decide, because we have a large student body of volunteers, we have a tremendous labor force that's right on campus, does it make sense for the students just to put their muscle into it? Uh, well, you know, there's problems in that as well, because unless you are very, very careful, every part of Japanese knotweed, if you drop it somewhere, it will sprout again and start a new colony. Uh, does it make sense to just buy a big tarp and cover it for five years so it doesn't get any sunlight and it can't reproduce its carbohydrate stores in the underground root system? There are, there are all these various ways. N n there isn't one of them that's perfect. Every single one of them has pluses and minuses. But uh, this uh, collaboration that we have has been very fertile so far. Part, part of, part of the, um, the Illinois Coastal Management Program grant will be to use Seminary Ravine as an example for people so that you can go and you can learn. And part of that will be you know, printed communication, part of it will be work, work days, part of it will be ongoing things. Every child in Lake Forest that's in elementary school uh, goes through a, a ravine education program, which is kind of neat. Now, obviously, they're not the ones getting down there and doing the work days, that sort of thing. But I think this is really the beginning of having some concentrated efforts where the community comes together and starts to get in there and do those things and helps individual landowners, too. Okay. And I just wanted to mention, too, we're going to have the Lake Forest College. We're going to make sure it's an eight-year program so we keep these students around for a really long time to help us. <laughs> No, question in the back. Uh, I'm from Lake Bluff, and uh, I wanted to point out in terms of best practices, there's a grant-funded ravine project that just finished up two months ago. It's at Moffitt and Ravine Avenue, and it involves, uh, from your slides, there are a couple of rocky solutions, and one was gabion baskets, which are really not preferable, because when you think 50 years down the line, those baskets will rot and will fall out. Seems to be the state of the art that was that was done in this Lake Bluff ravine was loose rock, what we're calling riprap, that can change the contour of the ravine as it erodes. But it's, it's easy to see just go to Moffat Road and Ravine and look uh, either way, and it, it's it's a rather immense project. Thankfully, grant funded. Uh, that was one issue, but it, in Lake Bluff we have the same issue you just described in terms of ownership. And this patchwork of, well, in Lake Love, we've got village, park district, and private. And you know, you walk 10 feet and you could be through three different ownerships, which makes management of the problem impossible. And I'm wondering, from the Lake Forest City point of view, how bad does it have to get before we start considering something like, dare I say, eminent domain or just call the waterway a municipal resource or something so that we can employ, you know, one plan that doesn't require hard-pressed homeowners to go bankrupt or something, managing this incredible problem, and I know that in the Walden Ravine area it's terrible, and there just has to be, at some point we've got to have a broader solution than just 
just waiting or encouraging or sending mailings to Caribbean homeowners. What are the prospects for that change in how the municipality will approach this resource question? Bob, would you like to field that one? <laughs> Thank you. Leave me the easy one. Huh? Or Alderman Edelman. <laughs> Um, it's a great question and actually I think it was stated on numerous occasions. I think this is an area that we are really just learning about. We're just scratching the surface right now. There have been some uh, staff conversations and discussions about what would it mean to uh, take over all the ravines in the city of Lake Forest. Uh, I think, uh, you know, back of the envelope it would be millions and millions of dollars simply because we would have to compensate all of the property owners the value of their ravine. Uh, some might be willing to give it to us. I think many of them would be looking for some just compensation which they would be rightfully owed under eminent domain. I think there are other approaches though that we could look at, other creative financing mechanisms that we could use to try and work with uh, the individual homeowners. And I think tonight is simply uh, to start the conversation and the discussion. And I think either through the collaborative or through other meetings like this, we have to continue those conversations and try and work on uh, coming up with the solutions because I think we all recognize this problem is not going to go away. It's only going to get more expensive. So we need to begin working at it and not only educating the people who are here tonight, but unfortunately, those that are not here tonight probably need more education than those that are. So um, I know I don't have a good answer for you, but that's simply because I don't think right now we've put a magnitude of dollars on that. And I think if we went to the taxpayers and said, well, we need $100 million to purchase all the ravines in Lake Forest, I'm not sure that would pass. And so, <laughs> right, and so I think we have to come up with creative ways because it is a balancing act as well. I think we have to recognize that there are some property rights here, and if I uh, didn't live on a ravine and I live somewhere else, I would say, well, yeah, I understand the stormwater aspects of the ravine, but if you use my tax dollars to improve your property values, is that fair? So I think those are the kinds of conversations that we at least need to start engaging in and having in our community. Um, just to add to that, too, I don't know, um, a lot of the ravines, I think, in those neighborhoods, there's good homeowners associations or there's a group that know each other and live nearby. I mean, we would encourage you to connect with them and start talking about your ravines and taking a look at them together and see what small things you can do. Because Peter mentioned it, you know, we have made some progress, but we certainly think that there could be a little bit more um, awareness and, and maybe... A lot of times they look over the ravine, they don't look down the ravine, and, and that could be a, just a nice, uh, easy way to start. Um, I'm going to go to the young lady in the back who hasn't asked yet, but then we'll come back. Yes, this is just a question to clarify the map up there. So is that, like, is that big road, right, the straight one, is that one uh, Green Bay or Western? Or where is that? Is this one here? Yeah. Okay, that is, well, that's Western Avenue. Okay, and then the, the large green um, area down, down at the bottom, uh -huh. is that It's, it's not Lake Forest. Oh, this is, it's in Lake Forest, but it is Lake County Forest Preserve. Oh, okay. So Starting the here. See that line right there? This, right. this would be McCormick Ravine, just this portion. So that's your Woodland that all the time Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yes. Um, wait, is it the city or Okay. I'm curious why that. I'm curious why the city has not passed an ordinance, though, regarding leaf dumping or yard waste dumping, as other cities on the North Shore have passed. Uh, it's obviously recommended not to do it. It's in all the brochures, and I'm happy to hear the city workers themselves have been you know, educated about it. Not doing it. Why have we not done an ordinance ourselves? Um, do you not know of one? Um, there. Come on. <laughs> I'm Kathy Cerniak with the city also. Uh, the city does not permit, city code does not permit dumping in ravines or on vacant lots or, um, so it's a matter of enforcement and identifying who's doing it. So it's, it's a challenge. Years ago, we got a letter from the city <coughs> telling us not to do it anymore. And then we looked and got after our landscapers and stopped it and hauled all that stuff out. If we do situation, if we do see, see situations, we first send out a co courtesy notice. <coughs> Uh, we can proceed with a notice of violation. Do I hear? 
somebody told us that um, oak trees need the acid from the leaves that decompose. So if you have oak tree leaves in your front yard and you put them back in the woods with the other oak trees, you're basically dumping oak tree leaves that have the acid that the trees need. So I'm not sure that I concur with the... One of our arborists or somebody want to answer that? Glenn, this is up here, Alan. Peter, Peter, Peter maybe do. <coughs> I want to repeat the question, Peter? Just so. The question was uh, about oak leaves and the fact that they do create uh, an acidic base, which they do. Uh, I think the real question here is, are you taking other leaves from your property and dumping it over the ravine? So uh, naturally, leaves fall out of the trees. Uh, they land on the ravine floor. Uh, that's usually enough acidity to go ahead and amend those soils over time. Keep in mind that changing the pH of soil takes many, many, many years, and so it's not something that just happens overnight. So uh, what is a bigger uh, problem is that when you dump more leaves over the ravine, some of them can be invasive. They can have invasive seeds like Norway maples, uh, but they don't allow other plants to grow, and therefore uh, they don't decompose. Um, and so you get such a big, heavy leaf bed that uh, it sits wet for many, many years, and so you're really not acidifying the soil. The second question as far as somebody indicated that the salt from the roads that we use for snow removal get into the ravines. Is the city thinking that using sand instead of salt like they do in Wisconsin is a... Uh, Procedure yeah, well, uh, Michael Thomas is here, our director of public works, uh, but uh, you would be right in saying that it does make it to the ravines because they naturally go into our storm sewers. Uh, the problem with using sand here is that that's what we have, our storm sewers, and so it actually goes ahead and settles out, and then we have sediment and buildup, and we have to go ahead and actually extract that out because not all of it will make it to the ravine uh, bottom. And so uh, for us, sand is an effective, or I'm sorry, salt is an effective product. Uh, it's a melting agent where sand isn't. It's more of a gripping agent. Agent, uh, and because we have so much invested in our infrastructure, uh, sand is just not the product. Where you go up north into Michigan, you'll see that they don't have that same infrastructure, and then that naturally uh, goes down a lot of their topography. the other one where you have uh, you have white suckers coming in they're 12 to 15 inch mature fish and they go all the way up to the college it's amazing how far they go up the stream and uh, it wouldn't take much to particularly early spring in Walden and uh, and the seminary ravine have some volunteer crews go in and make sure you don't have logs jamming up some of the stream base that would come down over the winter to make it a little easier several of these ravines, and I think that they, 
One thing I do thank you for your comments, um, and I do just want to reiterate uh, when you mentioned some of the small things, the restoration that we're talking about uh, with the grants, it is big money and it's big projects. Um, but the important thing to remember is if you get that log or that uh, debris out of the way, it could have a huge impact on avoiding those kind of costs. It, do it doesn't take long for one down tree to reroute the water and cause erosion. So we're not only looking at the bigger restoration, the ones that are massive uh, engineering and ecological feats, but we're also recognizing that there's a lot of little things. If we do them now, we're gonna save a lot of money down the road. Sandy, just thought I'd mention this is really premature, but is the pro very preliminary plans from the Army Corps in McCormick would have holding pools going up through McCormick, which would be very cool. And that's where the fish are going to go. Other questions? Young man, didn't you have your hand up earlier? No? Uh, well, go, go ahead. Well, I was kind of thinking, like you were saying, like volunteer, maybe like high school students, because I know like our enviro classes are helping with some of the supplements, and like the buckboard in front of our like school, like on the bike path. So I was just thinking, maybe That would be great. <laughs> Sign up. Thank you for saying that. I want your card. <laughs> uh, Rami? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Chris? The city dropped a huge drain pipe down our ravine, and it's trapping water against the sides of some of the ravine where big trees are getting ready to fall, maybe on top of that pipe. I've called the engineers, but nobody's contacted me. And what ravine would that be? The Mayflower Ravine. <laughs> That city dropped that enormous drain pipe with helicopters, and it runs down the bottom Sanitary of the Sanitary pipe, you mean the Seminary Ravine? That's what you're asking. Well, I'm on yeah. the Mayflower. Yeah, it's, yeah. No, yeah. I think that's a sanitary pipe that's oh. there, and the uh, city does. Peter, why don't you come in and climb? Okay. Thank you. 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 Uh, that particular pipe, the large black pipe that you see down there that actually goes from uh, the mouth of Lake Michigan by Forest Park Beach and then heads up down Mayflower towards your house, it's actually a sanitary pipe and we do walk that quite frequently because you can imagine uh, we don't want any accidents to occur. Um, and a lot of those homes are private and we do a lot of tree work to maintain a good buffer. So if there's something you see, please let us know. We want to address it right away. Um, the last time we were there was approximately four weeks ago uh, to take just a 12 inch tree uh, away from the pipe um, and go figure it was an ash tree. So uh, <laughs> that is something that we, we do on a regular basis. Our water and sewer department walks that and the forestry crews follow through uh, with any hangups that are there. Rami, you want to go next? Go ahead. Um, yes, first of all, I wanted to congratulate, congratulate all of you because I, I think you did a really good job tonight of um, pointing out what a completely unique ecological ecology this is in the world. And, and, and I want to just also thank you for all the hard work you've done in getting these grants because I know that's, that's arduous and, and, um, and you should be congratulated for that. The, I, I wrote down just a, a, a bunch of dot points that occurred to me. Um, for example, you know, someday, John Santel, I hope that there's a North Shore Ravine Association, so so that there is a not-for-profit that is that unites all of these communities in understanding this. Um, second of all, I think your dream is something that would really fire people's imaginations. That is, to to restore the fish in the amphibians is something that young people at all the way through old timers like me could really understand. And and from the buckthorn killing the, the, the frogs with the toxicity of their leaves and their stems and all the way through the you know the concrete at the base of the ravines. Um, um, it's something that, that that does you know that is a goal that people can can strive for and um, and understand. Um, working with groups like Trout Unlimited, obviously, 
and even um, something simple like naming all the ravines so that there's buy-in. You know, you, I can see lots of little blue, blue ravines like the North End Forest Park or <laughs> Woodbine, whatever. You know, get people engaged in, in, in you know, owning them. Um, and, and, and the city needs to help us create a model. You know, maybe it's a ravine overlay district on the east <coughs> side of um, Lake Forest because, for example, I've gigantic asphalt driveway. Um, um, it drains right into the street, storm sewers and the street. I don't, you know, um, when that was put in, it was before me, but the permit needs to look at how to capture that water before it flows in, or Western Avenue, where are all those storm sewers going? Are they filtering through, through, through plants before they go into these storm sewers? Um, Workshops for maintenance crews. You know, um, there's just there's just like an end. I know there's an endless thing that you're all thinking about, but but um, but there needs to be that that um, umbrella of, of a single goal, and I'm just throwing out the fish and the, and the frogs. Well, Rami, thanks for your enthusiasm for all that. There's a, a many many ideas. I can tell you when we got this grant from the Illinois Coastal Management Program, one of the things they really gave it to us for, I believe, is because they think that Lake Forest has the potential to be such a model that can be shared with other people. And so that's what's very exciting. And I think when we get people together, we can come up with some creative ideas. I mean, all the way from, you know, I, I don't know much about property tax reductions or reinvestment of property taxes for portions of the ravines because it pays off for infrastructure or what you talked about, associations, naming rights. These are all great ideas what we should explore. And so it's about getting a plan, and, and I think that um, we have some, we can really uh, show the rest of uh, the North Shore how it's done. Sure, go ahead. Um, my question is, does the city have any tools uh, that would allow what is done in the West mostly, but drainage and migratory overlays that are easements that the city takes on from owners that would be numbered and a secondary benefit is it's a tax relief to the owners who are now being taxed on ravines as table land. So I'm wondering if the city lawyers have looked at that, researched it, <coughs> any opinions on it, have any incentive to do it? I, I do not have background on that, but we can certainly take a look know, at it. John, I don't think the city has. I don't know if Open Lands has ever looked at that in the past. Well, I mean, we held a couple of conservation well, needs. Uh, um, yeah, so... Um, we have a couple of conservation easements that are within ravines, but you know it's it's very individualized in terms of property tax reduction of you know what you get for that kind of thing. But I think John, you're talking about something that's a really good thing to look into. Um, you look on the internet. And municipalities yeah. Have granted these all over. Yeah. I think, John, my only comment would be uh, to the extent you have some of that information, feed it to us because some of the other, and I'll just use the historic preservation tax credits that are there, are actually state law. So we would have to look to state law, but we we're happy to put something together and work with our local legislators to try and make that happen. Okay, we'll go with Sandy, and, and, and if there's somebody who has the well, last one, because I know we're, we're running late and want to keep right. people too long. So go ahead, Sandy. Uh, am I correct that the Army Corps of Engineers identifies the streams at the bed of the ravines as wetlands? Hmm. Therefore, that might give some power to municipalities to make sure that they're not degraded in any way with expenses falling in or, uh, you know, if stormwater drainage is not handled properly. Um, you know, the, the question was, does, how does the Army Corps classify ravine beds? And that is a very big question. And there's two ways that the Army Corps could be involved in ravine beds. One is by classifying as wetlands. The other one would be waters of the United States. And, it, it, you know, it's very individualized. But I would say you're talking about the big gray area right there. Um, and um, so hopefully that's, you know, issues that will resolve themselves, you know, and won't have to be presented, yeah. Okay. Um, Our final question. This spring, the city of Barkham, I guess, a big study on the storm water uh, plan across the drainage study. 
where does that stand? It started, I guess, Bob Ellis sent a letter out to everyone in the city. And where does that stand? Michael. What have we learned from that? I'll let Michael Thomas answer that question for you. He's our Director of Public Works. I thought I could get by. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the stormwater study, the results are going to be presented uh, to our Finance Committee at the November 8th budget meeting. So we have preliminary results that have listed approximately 12 projects uh, throughout the city. So we're going to review those with our Finance uh, Committee members and then go ahead and budget and work at those uh, in the upcoming years. Do some of them, uh, just without well, telling me the answer, if you're presenting finance committees, is it related to the ravine zone? Is some of it help in terms of... Yeah, it's, it's, the no, it's, it's more so focusing on trying to drain the, the water, as, as others have spoken about earlier, um, to alleviate the drainage issues in various pockets throughout the city. Um, there was a little bit of a review on the ravines, but more so from a maintenance standpoint of things that Peter noted and Chuck noted, where are things that we need to do to uh, allow water to flow freer, um, but that was the extent of it. So. Um, so anyway, uh, very interesting stuff from my perspective. Um, none of the ravines are in my ward. Um, and it seems to me there's a lot of enthusiasm for doing things among people with the city, uh, with open lands, some other governmental agencies. But as I sit and listen to this, it, for anything to really happen on a large scale here with the ravines, I think the enthusiasm has to come from private property owners who sit on the ravines. So you talk about mechanisms for, you know, creating easements and other things. The people who have to be interested in doing that are the people who own them. Um, you know, we talked about this at breakfast when, you know, when we were putting this thing together about, you know, the, the big impediment to doing anything is you can't get grants to improve private property. So the private property people have to be interested in doing something to allow resources to flow into this project. And, you know, it's never going to happen if the people on, you know, the, the west end of Lake Forest say, well, we really want those ravines restored. Well, great. It's not your land and, uh, you know, give us the money and maybe we'll do it. There would be much less interest then. So for those of you who live on ravines, um, I think I would encourage you to talk to your neighbors and try and generate some enthusiasm for coming back to the city and encouraging us to look at mechanisms by which we can do things to open the ravines up to sort of a little more public involvement. Um, because much of what we hear, like when it came up in the fence debate, is about how these were private lands and how they were being trespassed on all the time by other people in the city. And yet people in the city look at those lands, at, at the ravines as being a, sort of a treasure for the city, and yet many of the private property owners look at them as being a treasure for themselves. And so we have to sort of break that log jam. But I think well, the problem. Yeah, but it's just like your backyard. You treasure your backyard. And And, and I totally get it, but then how do we get to the point where you can actually move resources to restore private ravines? I mean, it, it ends up being one of those things you say, well, you know, we'd love to have our ravines re restored, but we want them to be our private land. I, you know, to some extent, it just doesn't work. Um, and so that's what I'm saying, is that it seems to me that unless the, the ravine owners start to generate some enthusiasm for looking into creative mechanisms whereby money can flow into these things and resources can flow. The only ravines that will get rebuilt will be the ones that are already owned by the college and the city and the park district or, or the, uh, um, the county. Um, so anyway, I would just encourage those of you who live on ravines to maybe sort of talk to your neighbors and see, uh, see what comes out of it. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you. 
if you didn't sign in, if you could before you leave, and just make sure we can uh, read your email address, because that way we can keep in touch with you about upcoming work days together. Thanks.